And our next presentation is uh, by Steve Knowlton. Uh, coming from uh, New Jersey, uh, Steve Knowlton uh, recently concluded his tenure as editor of our quarterly full color magazine, Vexillum, and has presented papers at NAVA annual meetings as well as at a FIAV conference. Uh, he is also a member of the Chesapeake Bay Flag Association and won the driver award at the 2012 NAVA annual meeting. He is presenting his paper today on convoluted icon iconography. I'm sorry, I I can't speak. Uh, notwithstanding, uh, competing interpretations of flag use during the immigration law protests of 2006. Steve, I'll bring up your presentation. In the spring of 2006, uh, massive protests arouse, arose in cities around the country to oppose a bill which would attempt to slow down unauthorized immigration through measures that critics thought were too harsh in their penalties. These protests witnessed a largely unprecedented mobilization of unauthorized immigrants for political purposes. Of interest to vexillology, many of the protesters flew the flags of Mexico and other Latin American countries, either alone or alongside the US flag. Reaction to these rallies often included vehement denunciation of the use of non-American flags. And in response to that, protest organizers asked marchers to bring only US flags. So today I'd like to talk about the flag related events of 2006 and the rhetoric surrounding them, as well as the stated motivations of the marchers. And uh, we'll examine this as a visual argument, which is one mode of symbolic conflict. Immigration in the United States has always been a contentious issue. The most recent comprehensive law regarding immigration was passed in 1986. It provided amnesty to those who had previously settled in the U.S. without authorization, and it criminalized the hiring of unauthorized immigrants. Although the 1986 Act was intended to stabilize immigration numbers, by 2005 it was estimated that more than 10 million unauthorized immigrants were living in the United States. The rate of entrance of unauthorized immigrants nearly matched the rate of authorized immigrants. By 2004, among unauthorized immigrants, 57% came from Mexico and another 24% from other Latin American nations, whereas uh, among authorized immigrants, 19% were Mexican and 17% from other Latin American countries. Beyond federal law, there were other efforts to discourage unauthorized immigration at the state level. One such undertaking was Proposition 187, a 1994 ballot initiative in California that limited the provision of government services to unauthorized immigrants. And despite protests against it, including some where the Mexican flag was displayed alongside the American, the initiative passed. Many of the advocates of Proposition 187 reported that undecided voters told them that the display of Mexican flags at the protest persuaded undecided voters to opt for the proposition. In 2005, citing a need to, quote, restore the integrity of our nation's borders and reestablish respect for our laws, U.S. Representative James Sensenbrenner introduced House Resolution 4437. Among other provisions, H.R. 4437 would make living in the U.S. without authorization a federal crime rather than a civil infraction and uh, require local law enforcement agencies to turn over unauthorized immigrants to federal agents for deportation. There were heavy fines for employers hiring unauthorized immigrants and a prohibition on offering aid to help a person stay in the U.S. It passed the House in December 2005 and was scheduled for debate by the Senate in the spring of 2006. Within weeks of its passage, protests against H.R. 4437 were organized. Although people of all ethnicities participated, the protests were primarily attended by Latinos. Their opposition to the bill stemmed not only from practical concerns about the possible disruption of their families and communities by prosecution, but also from what they perceived as the bill's implicit rejection of unauthorized immigrants as unwelcome in American society. Among the signs that were waved at protests were phrases like, we are America, and we're not the problem, we are part of the solution. These protests were some of the largest in American history, and they're notable for the fact that many unauthorized immigrants made themselves publicly visible and risked involvement with law enforcement. It was one of the first times that unauthorized immigrants became a visible presence among the political factions in the United States. These protests were initiated when a group of 600 Latino immigration rights activists met in February of 2006. 
Word spread through churches, labor unions, and Spanish language radio stations. Because the, of the syndicated nature of many popular radio shows, an idea that originated in California was quickly adopted all across the country. The first large rally took place in Chicago on March 10th. Up to 100,000 marchers filled downtown. In this case, the radio host, uh, Rafael Pistolero Pulido, who had been encouraging his listeners to attend, urged protesters to wear white clothes and bring American flags to symbolize their patriotism. The Chicago Tribune reported that of the flags seen in the protest, almost all were American flags. But other observers noted thousands of people waving Mexican flags. Smaller protests around the country followed, but more importantly, so did reaction in the media. In the English language media, there was widespread perception that protesters using Mexican and other flags doesn't help their cause, as Fred Barnes said on Fox News. The most extreme opinions echoed Michelle Malkin, who claimed that it represented the threat of reconquista, or a retaking of southern states from US control. Rick Hume called it a repellent spectacle. But most reactions were similar to everyday English-speaking Americans writing letters to the editor who made comments like, if they love Mexico so much that they have to fly the Mexican flag, then they should go back to their country they love and let us live in our beloved country happily. Even some Latino media figures expressed reservations about using the Mexican flag. Ruben Navarrete wrote, I'm getting fed up with flamboyant, self-satisfying street protests, thousands of people waving Mexican flags, granted alongside a fair number of American flags, who seem completely unaware that they're killing their own cause. Spanish-speaking media opinion was mixed as well. Even among people sympathetic to the protesters, there was a general sense that the use of Mexican and other flags was unwise politically. Juan Jose Garcia felt that those waving Mexican flags had failed to learn the lessons of the Proposition 187 campaign and offended many decent citizens who felt attacked and humiliated by the foreign, especially Mexican flags, celebrating the Great Awakening. Another protest occurred among high school students in a number of California schools. Thousands left school waving Mexican flags, carrying red, white, and green balloons, and chanting, Viva Mexico. The next day, half a million protesters filled the streets of Los Angeles. In preparation for this rally, organizers sought to ward off criticism about Mexican flags. And in the publicity leading up to the march, some organizers encouraged attendees to wear white and bring US flags. Other organizers said that if a flag of a home country were to be brought, it should be carried alongside the US flag. In making the case to fly only US flags, concern was expressed about alienating non-immigrant Americans. This can be seen in comments by political consultants of both parties. Republican Wayne Johnson commented that marchers who carried American flags got it right. They were saying, we embrace the American dream. Democrat Darius Regal noted that the Mexican flag visually says, I'm not one of you, I'm from there. And of course, because of the visual appeal of flags, they were the subject for a lot of political cartoons. More large rallies occurred on April 10th in cities across the country. Marchers were explicitly asked to bring only US flags. Juan Carlos Ruiz, an organizer, noted, you're going to see a sea of people wearing white shirts, carrying the American flag, honoring this country, because this is the country we want to belong to. This doesn't mean we are renouncing our love we have for our home countries. All it shows is that we want to be here, we are committed and pledged to the values and symbols of this country. In many cities, the rallies included a recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. Some Mexican flags did appear in Los Angeles, but the dominant image was one of American flags. An analysis of images from across the nation by Mike Pesca of National Public Radio showed that US flags outnumbered flags of other nations by about 20 to 1. Interestingly, in New York City, Rally organizers gave no instructions about flags, and Pesca found that in the Big Apple, U.S. flags only outnumbered other flags by about four to three. Fox News correspondent William Lajeunesse noted the change in flag-waving behavior, but still felt compelled to say that nine out of ten people are still speaking Spanish here, leaving opponents to call the demonstration a charade. The last of the major rallies occurred on May 1st. Organizers also called for unauthorized immigrants to boycott businesses and take a day off work. 
that was called A Day Without Immigrants and was intended to highlight the many contributions to commerce and society made by unauthorized immigrants. However, the call to boycott proved divisive as many immigration advocates feared that a, a negative backlash at a sensitive time when the Senate was considering an alternative to H.R. 4437. These May 1st rallies turned out over 400,000 in Los Angeles and caused the shutdown of many factories, landscaping businesses, restaurants, and other businesses that rely on Latino workers. Rallies in other cities included 400,000 in Chicago, adding up to a total of around a million people nationwide. The Los Angeles rally included a gigantic U.S. flag carried by hundreds of protesters, and again saw U.S. handheld flags outnumbering other flags. In the end, the Senate never even brought up H.R. 4437 for consideration. Similarly, legislation that originated in the Senate was not considered by the House. There has not to date been any comprehensive immigration reform legislation passed at the federal level. So whether the flag flying was a shrewd political move or not, we can point to one group that definitely benefited, and that was street vendors. An uh, early April rally in Costa Mesa, California, saw handheld Mexican flags selling for about $3, and that's uh, $4.30 uh, as of April. Uh, and they outsold American flags because the rally organizers were giving away American flags to the attendees. So the politics of this are, of course, interesting, but I think as a vexillologist, we can turn our attention to another matter, and that is, what did these flags mean to those who flew them and to those who saw them? We have already seen that many non-immigrants who witnessed the Mexican and other flags interpreted them as a sign of allegiance to Mexico or another country, and thus a rejection of assimilation in the U.S., and rally organizers responded to that by encouraging attendees to eschew the Mexican and other flags because they were aware that such perceptions existed. I think if we assume that the marchers wish to gain favor for their position and not deliberately antagonize their opponents, they must have chosen to fly Mexican and other flags for some strong reason. And I'd like to examine their own testimony to investigate the motivations. And we can also look at some scholars' uh, thoughts on this. So the great majority of testimony in interviews in newspapers, letters to the editor, et cetera, regarding the use of Mexican and other flags in the protest expresses a desire to act like other Americans who are descended from immigrants. One person said, there are many people who can understand a parade with Irish flags in New York City but who are scared to see Mexican flags on the streets of Los Angeles, even though the flags are very similar. One advocate, Chan Noriega, explained that for some people it's a symbol of their origin and that of their parents, and they want to honor it. For others, it's part of their identity, and in that sense, they ask that it be respected. Another person detected a whiff of hypocrisy among her critics. The act of carrying the Mexican flag is considered repellent but not so those who carry the Irish, Italian, or Israeli flags. All these legislators are proud of their Irish, Italian, Polish, etc. origins. Why not feel proud of Mexican-American, Peruvian-American, Argentine-American origins? That's the beautiful thing about this country. One can see Italian-Americans dancing salsa or a Mexican-American making sushi. Other marchers refused to put down the flags of their home countries because they saw them as symbols of resistance to prejudice. After anti-immigrant protesters burned a Mexican flag in San Diego, one marcher retorted that we're not going to lower ourselves to that level. We'll continue to march with the flag of our country of origin and the American flag. And there was a small minority that did reject the use of the American flag. Uh, one person said, how can we use the flag of the country that stole our land? and where we are currently treated like criminals and delinquents. Our flag is something that unites us with the boys and girls of the neighborhood, the mothers and grandmothers. The flag represents unity, independence, history, and the most esteemed values of the Mexican nation. That was a, a very small minority. Aside from that one quote, none of the witnesses that I found testify to any desire to disclaim their identity as Americans. In all these statements, Mexican or other ethnic identity is not opposed to American identity, but rather it is perceived and stated as an additional source of pride and strength. But as we saw from the earlier quotes, there were critics of the protesters' use of flags, and they stated that they considered them to be subversive. 
in their eyes, the use of a Mexican flag was a sign that the flag waver was not interested in assimilating into American society. These critics never referred to the meaning flag wavers assigned to their own use of symbols, but rather they assumed a different meaning and asserted that meaning as if it were true. There are some pundits who took a higher level view um, and saw the use of the Mexican and other flags um, actually as a way of highlighting misunderstandings around assimilation that the critics were promoting. Clarence Page, who is a nationally syndicated columnist, noted that Americans are simultaneously proud yet oddly unsettled by their own diversity. And I understand why many immigrants are confused by the flag fuss. In ethnic mixing bowls like Chicago, foreign flags wave proudly on special days, St. Patrick's Day, Columbus Day. It seems to be an unwritten but strictly observed rule in this country of immigrants that you are allowed to show your ancestral homeland's flag one day a year. Those who worry about whether the new Hispanic immigrants really want to be American should rest easy because the newcomers appear to be following the patterns of past immigrant groups. If some of the older immigrants are slow to learn English and American ways, the children seem eager to embrace both. But on the other hand, Gregory Rodriguez of the think tank New America Foundation did accept the notion that using Mexican flag is contrary to a fully assimilated identity. However, he attributed that to the virtually continuous process of immigration from Mexico, which had been going on for more than 100 years. He said the resulting population had varying levels of acculturation and integration, and noted that although this dynamic hasn't prevented assimilation, it has sown confusion and competition in the formulation of political and cultural identities. Witness the competing presence of US and Mexican flags at last week's demonstration. But convoluted iconography notwithstanding, the massive declaration of the desire to become an accepted part of American society puts an exclamation point on what has been shaping immigrant culture in the US for the last decade. Last week, immigrants and their children were telling us that they are no longer willing to be seen as homing pigeons who return to their homelands after a season of work. For me as a vexillologist, the most interesting part of this story might be how easily different parties attribute meaning to the flag use of others. The scholars Richard Pineda and Stacy Sowards call these varying interpretations of flag use a visual argument. They say, flag wavers assert that they are both Mexican or another nationality and American. To critics, however, waving another country's flag demonstrates that the waver is not American. Pineda and Sowards posit that the change in flag use from the strong presence of non-American flags in the early protests to the predominant display of US flags in later protests demonstrates what they call the adaptive process of rebuttal, just as in a verbal argument. It's possible to extend the analysis of Pineda and Sowards. Arguments arise from conflict. To note that symbols such as flags are used to make visual arguments is valid, but touches merely upon the mode of conflict rather than its nature. At the root of the varying interpretations of the meaning of the Mexican flag within these protests is a phenomenon known as symbolic conflict. This idea was developed by the anthropologist Simon Harrison, and he observes that within any society there's a limited supply of symbolic capital, that is, honor, prestige, and distinction associated with different forms of cultural expression. And examples include the different esteem with which uh, classical music and uh, formal speech are held, generally, compared to pop music and slang. These forms of cultural expression are symbolic of different groups and members of the groups will employ manipulation of symbols alongside other forms of competition such as politics to affect the distribution of symbolic capital. Visual arguments using symbols are proxies for larger struggles for status and recognition. In Harrison's schema of symbolic conflict, one con type of contest is the valuation contest in which the issue at stake is the ranking of symbols according to some criterion of worth, such as prestige, legitimacy, or sacredness. And among the tactics that can be used in this conflict is the attempt to diminish the value of rival symbols. So using Harrison's analysis, the fight over flag use in 2006 was a valuation contest. Immigrant advocates, by and large, used the flags of their home countries to stake a claim that Mexican or other ethnicity was similar to ethnicities among white Americans, such as Irish or Italian. But the anti-immigrant voices countered that claim by offering an interpretation of the Mexican flag that delegitimized it. 
Rather than accepting Mexican ethnicity as similar to Irish or Italian, the critics asserted, without reference to the stated motives of those flying the Mexican flag, that the flag symbolized an intent to disavow loyalty to the United States. Symbol symbolic conflict is not always decided by its merits, and in the case of the anti-immigrant critics, they had within their arsenal a deep-seated cultural reverence for the United States flag. And by placing Mexican and other flags in opposition to the US flag, as opposed to complementary to it, they gained a rhetorical advantage because non-immigrant viewers who are unfamiliar with immigrant use of Mexican flags are familiar with tropes of loyalty to the stars and stripes. Flags are polysemic. They carry multiple meanings depending on the viewer, the context, and cultural understandings. So the assimilationist motives of the marchers were not obvious to all. Their symbolic efforts to give the Mexican flag the same status as the Irish or Italian flag were vulnerable to counter assertions about its meaning. And so this symbolic conflict, we see the anti-immigration voices harnessed almost unconscious reverence for the US flag to plant doubts about the meaning of the Mexican flag in the context of the marches. And in this valuation contest, the struggle to elevate Latin American flags faced off against an effort to delegitimize them as symbols of assimilation. And in large part, the delegitimization tactic worked as rally organizers discouraged the use of Mexican and other flags to assert their symbolic claims. <laughs> yes. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, my, my first one is uh, the comparing the, 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 the Mexican flag versus the Irish and Italian. It's like also comparing. I guess my question is: Is was there? Did you look into comparing the impact of the Mexican flag specifically versus like other Latin American flags because of the specific? relationship that America has with Mexico. Would you repeat the question for Sure. Um, so Vern is asking if I um, examined the use of the Mexican flag as opposed to other Latin American or uh, other international flags. Uh, Specifically Latin American, because yeah. when you compare it to the Irish or Italian, yeah. whether or not you're talking about the, the, the element of racism and all, right. and the history, but it also the same element of racism could be applied between Mexico and let's say Colombia, but we don't have a specific relationship with in history with Colombia that we do with. Right. Uh, the concern being that because the United States has a, a long and complicated relationship with Mexico, specifically as opposed to countries further south, yeah. um, uh, was there an analysis available um, for the Mexican flag versus the Guatemalan flag, for example. And um, I will say that almost all the discussion from the critics focused on the Mexican flag specifically. Um, I didn't really see anyone bringing up any of the other flags, although they're visible in, in the uh, images. Um, the, the Mexican flag, I would say, based on uh, my memory, was accounted for about 90% of the non-US flags that were being shown in most of the pictures. So, so the, um, the focus of the critics was on the Mexican flag specifically. And because my time was limited, I didn't um, include everything that's in the written version of this paper, but there is a lot to be discussed regarding immigrant uh, attitudes about Mexicans specifically, Latin Americans generally, as opposed to immigrants from uh, other countries. Uh, yes, um, in the back. Um, did you observe the huge protests, any combination of American and Mexican flags, and where do they put all this? Right. I didn't see the, any of those in the pictures, and I believe that's an innovation um, in the flag industry that came about slightly later. Are we out of time? Actually, um, let's, let's take your question and then we have one in chat. I believe. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, so my question, uh, I listened to the NPR uh, report on Prop 187 and one of the things they talked about uh, was high schoolers 
who are, you know, second, third generation immigrants who saw themselves as American first. Um, did you see any differences in, uh, like, symbolism of the Mexican flag between recent immigrants and like, second and third generation immigrants? Right. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Most of the people who were interviewed or, or um, wrote into the newspaper didn't identify themselves that way. Um, however, most I would say most of the people who were the rally organizers and or advocates tended to be second or later generations. Um, so um, I'm going to say that there wasn't much difference um, because it didn't it didn't come out in the text I found, but um, that there's more research to be done there for sure. Uh, in chat, right? right. It's uh, less of a question, more of a comment by Steve Wheatley. Um, an extremely proper presentation that goes to the heart of the vexillological project, understanding the many imminent meanings in visual symbols. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, Bard. There's something special about California tactics and the part of the United States that it began to purpose. Uh, because the Houston part of Mexico, I wonder if you could compare this, this kind of analysis to the analysis of the presentation of the British by the 19th century in the, in the United States. Great question. Yeah. Uh, so Bard noted that um, in California, Texas, and the Southwest, uh, places that used to be part of the Mexican Republic, um, there might be a, a difference in um, the way the Mexican flag is viewed then in other parts of the country. And he, he asked if I could compare it to use of the British flag in the 19th century. And uh, I don't know anything about that. So I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Jack. But hope that some of the younger members of this room will revisit this for you 50 years from now uh, to see how the use of Mexican flag has changed, perhaps akin to that of the Irish and Italians, both of whom, when they came to this country in large numbers, were considered racially distinct and inferior and would never be able to assimilate into white American society. And yet, now, 100 years later, yeah, so for the audience, Jack was commenting that it's interesting um, how flag use um, in 2006 uh, might be interpreted by scholars in 50 years time, the way that um, scholars of today look at the assimilation of Irish and Italian immigrants in the 19th century who were considered a different race than um, the English and German settlers. Um, and I agree, you're right. I hope uh, that m more evidence will emerge. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just add a, a note that uh, I was very fortunate um, that we have a database at the library I work at, which accumulates Spanish language newspapers. Uh, and so uh, any translations are via Google, so forgive that. But um, I, I think uh, as more and more evidence, uh, libraries are doing more and more to collect evidence uh, from the experiences of uh, ethnic minorities. And so hopefully in the future, there will be even more evidence for scholars to work with. Thanks.